Hi, today's presentation will go over the application of ultrasound and hip arthrocentesis. Ultrasound has a variety of applications in the emergency room, including the assessment of the hip region. For example, it can be used in cases of symptomatic iliopsoas and greater trochanteric bursae. Ultrasound is also useful for hip joint injections, such as steroids or for an arthrogram. However, the main focus of this presentation will be on ultrasound-guided hip aspiration or arthrocentesis, as seen here on the right. When examining the hip, a curvilinear probe should be used under the MSK preset. A curvilinear probe uses lower frequency ultrasound, allowing a deep penetration and a wide depth of field, which is excellent for viewing the hip structures. If a curvilinear probe is not available, a linear probe, which tends to give better resolution, can be used on thinner patients. However, the majority of the time, the curvilinear is our go-to probe. It's also important that the patient's leg be positioned correctly in order to obtain an optimal view of the hip joint. This video will demonstrate proper leg positioning. Position the patient in um, prone position. The right foot should technically be angled inward. Sir, can you angle your foot inward? This allows for appropriate orientation of the femoral head and neck junction at the hip to um, allow for the most successful joint aspiration. Once the patient's leg is properly positioned, we can obtain a short axis view of the hip by placing the probe transversely at the proximal to mid thigh, as seen here. In this view, we can identify the femoral head and the iliopsoas muscle. The blue arrow indicates the iliopsoas tendon. Notice how it is hyperechoic. This is how the tendon should appear. Sometimes, however, tendons and muscle can appear hypoechoic. When this is the case, it is important to rule out a common artifact in MSK called anisotropy. Anisotropy is an artifact on ultrasound that can occur when the reflector is smooth and flat, as is the case of muscle or tendon. The bicep tendon in this example, indicated by the blue arrows, basically acts like a mirror. If the reflector is perpendicular to the probe, like on the left, the sound waves will reflect directly back to the probe, producing a bright image. If the reflector is not perpendicular to the sound waves, as on the right, the sound waves will not reflect directly back to the probe, and the image will misleadingly appear dark or hypoechoic. With that in mind, we can move away from the transverse probe at the anterior and move the probe superiorly and laterally, rotating the indicator dot towards the head. This will give us a view of the greater trochanter. In this view, we can appreciate the lateral facet as well as the tendinous gluteus medius insertion. Next, we can slide the probe medially and rotate the indicator towards the umbilicus. This gives us a longitudinal view of the anterior hip. Here we can see the femoral head, the acetabulum, and if we follow the femoral head, we can visualize the anterior recess where fluid is likely to accumulate in a hip effusion. This video will demonstrate how to properly position the probe longitudinally in order to obtain an optimal view of a hip joint effusion. Unfreeze. Unfreeze. Perfect. So once again, we are locating the femoral head neck junction, which again looks great. I don't see much of an effusion, but we know he has one based on the MRI, so we're going to aspirate. Decrease my depth currently, Donna. Beautiful picture. Save that. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. Maybe there's a tiny bit of fluid there. Save that. Longitudinal okay. ultrasound of the anterior recess of the hip. We're looking dead. Here's the straight femoral neck. Here's the femoral head neck junction. Here we can appreciate the difference between a hip joint with no effusion and a hip joint with a small effusion. 
In the center panel, we see a normal anterior recess with minimal distension of the joint capsule. On the right panel, we see a small hip joint effusion where the fluid has accumulated in the anterior recess causing the joint capsule to distend. Notice that the effusion is hypoechoic. However, before reporting a hip joint effusion on ultrasound, it should first be determined that the anterior hip joint recess, this area indicated here, measures greater than 8 millimeters. This is because the joint capsule is hypoechoic on ultrasound and can mimic a joint effusion. Additionally, it's also important to always compare the left and right hip joints. We already mentioned how a joint effusion will be hypoechoic, but other characteristics will be that it's compressible, avascular, and may contain mobile debris. This is in contrast to synovitis, which presents as echogenic, non-compressible, vascular as determined with Doppler flow, and may contain an immobile mass. If it is suspected that an effusion is indeed present, we can use the longitudinal view of the anterior hip to insert a needle using an in-plane approach as demonstrated here, as well as in the following video clip. Beautiful. You okay? Perfect. We've hit the bone, which is our landmark. Keep that sterile just in case there. Okay, sir. Let's get some fluid out, see if we can. Does that sound okay? Donna, will you bring that thing closer to me, please? regular 10 cc syringe. Okay. Following the attachment of the syringe, we can aspirate the fluid and complete the arthrocentesis. Now that we've covered ultrasound guided arthrocentesis for a hip joint effusion, we can change gears and take a brief look at how ultrasound can help in assessing symptomatic bursae, namely the illocellus and the greater trochanteric. The next few slides will briefly go over both of these, beginning with the iliopsoas bursa. Earlier we began with this transfer probe position on the anterior hip to get a view of the femoral head and the iliopsoas. By rotating the probe clockwise into an oblique transverse position like on the right, we can obtain a short axis view revealing the iliopsoas bursa as seen in the next slide. This view is ideal for an iliopsoas bursa intervention requiring the use of a needle. We can see the needle come in from an in-plane approach on the left. The blue arrow on the right represents the path of the needle during a typical iliopsoas bursa intervention just before it penetrates the bursa. The hyperechoic structure at the center is the iliopsoas tendon. Now we're going to go focus and revisit the greater trochanter. The second view we obtained was this one here of the greater trochanter longitudinally. It's also possible to visualize the greater trochanter transversely by rotating the probe 90 degrees as seen on the next slide. This probe position gives us an ideal view for assessing the greater trochanter's anterior and lateral aspects. 
It's also possible to make out the gluteus maximus muscle and the gluteus medius muscle. For example, we can identify calcium phosphate crystal deposition in the periarticular tissue of patients with hydroxyapatite deposition disease. We can see the hyperechoic crystals deposited on the tennis, tendinous insertion of the gluteus medius here and here, circled in blue. So in summary, we covered the basics of ultrasound-guided hip arthrocentesis. We talked about the use of a curvilinear probe under the MSK settings and proper leg positioning for an optimal view of the hip joint. We talked, uh, talked about anisotropy, an artifact of MSK ultrasound that can make muscle or tendon appear hypoechoic. And then with that in mind, we explored three key probe placements. One at the anterior hip, transversely over the proximal thigh. One at the lateral hip, longitudinally over the greater trochanter and then one at the anterior hip longitudinally over the proximal thigh with the indicator pointed towards the umbilicus. Importantly, this last position is highlighted in yellow because it represents the ideal position for assessing and aspirating hip joint effusions. We also discussed the 8 millimeter minimum length necessary for the um, anterior synovial recess to measure before a hip effusion can be reported on ultrasound. And we differentiated joint effusions from synovitis by describing effusions as hypoechoic, compressible, avascular, and possibly containing mobile debris. We concluded the arthrocentesis portion of this presentation with a video demonstrating the proper uh, implant technique for inserting the needle into the joint capsule under the guidance of ultrasound. The tail end of this presentation briefly went over two additional probe placements for assessing the iliopsoa bursa and greater trochanter bursa. These were, the, these were at the anterior hip, oblique transversely, and the lateral hip transversely, respectively. This concludes the presentation. Thank you for your time.